Well, I have good news for you. We are not going to use the syllabus this morning. <laughs> you know, I had a couple of individuals come by and they said, um, you know, we've got to leave. Um, and uh, I said, why are you leaving? They said, well, you know, well, we really need to get home and um, we'll read what you're going to present in the syllabus. And I said, no, you know you won't. <laughs> Because what I'm going to present is not in the syllabus. And then uh, at least uh, one person said, well, I'm going to stick around. <laughs> so maybe I should have announced it last night. <laughs> I do want to uh, mention something about the syllabus, though. Uh, we covered three sections of the syllabus. Uh, there are two uh, sections that we did not cover. And I really hope and pray that you will not file away this syllabus without reading those sections. Uh, one of them is uh, the presentation that I made at the Theology of Ordination Study Committee uh, in Washington. Uh, it dealt with two texts that I didn't touch upon very much here. Uh, one is Galatians 3.28, where it says that there's ne neither male nor female. That's one of the favorite texts of those who favor women's ordination to bring out and say, if there's no longer male or female, uh, then males and females can both be ordained to be elders and to be pastors. So I deal extensively with that text, studying it within the context of Galatians 3. And then the other text that is frequently used is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where uh, Peter says that all Christians are a royal priesthood. And so there you have the idea that because we're all priests, uh, therefore we can all serve as elders and pastors of the church. And uh, that's not exactly what the text is saying. I deal with that extensively. And uh, in that document also, there are many, many other points. Uh, I deal extensively with Junia. I deal extensively with Deborah, who is used as an example of someone who can uh, serve as a pastor and elder, although she wasn't a pastor or an elder. Uh, there's a long section on Phoebe. Uh, there's also some material on Ellen White because it said that Ellen White believed that uh, women could serve as pastors um, and that Ellen White actually was ordained and had a ministerial credential. Uh, and I show in there that Ellen White did have a ministerial credential, which was an honorary credential given to her. After all, she was God's prophet. So they, our leaders were kind of puzzled as to how, how we can recognize a prophet. So they gave her a credential, but uh, she was never ordained by the laying on of hands. Uh, she was never a pastor of a church. Nobody ever referred to her as Elder White or, uh, or Pastor Helen. Um, she was never a conference, a union, or a general conference president. In fact, she openly denied that she was the leader of the denomination. So uh, all of that material is in that long, the longest section in the syllabus uh, that deals with uh, Galatians 3.28 and 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And then the last section of the syllabus is what I presented at the most recent symposium uh, at our Secrets Unsealed headquarters. Uh, maybe I can tell you something about uh, the symposiums. Uh, we had September 23 and 24, uh, three scholars come in, Hispanic scholars, uh, to tape 20-minute segments about different issues relating to women's ordination. Uh, those three individuals were Mario Veloso, who um, served as field secretary of the General Conference for many years, as a doctor in theology, um, very highly respected in the Hispanic world. Uh, we also had uh, Guillermo Biaggi, uh, who is the president of the Euro-Asia Division. And uh, we also had Daniel Scarone. All of these guys are PhDs. I'm the only one that uh, was an MA. Uh, but uh, they uh, came in, we recorded uh, 20, 20 minute segments, and then we also did three panel discussions uh, where we just discussed uh, certain issues. Uh, then, uh, you know, about a week later, we had 15 individuals come from all across the United States, English speaking. Uh, many of them had belonged to the Theology of Ordination Study Committee, many of them had doctorates, uh, and um, actually, one of them was, is teaching in one of the theology schools uh, here in the United States, Ingo Sorke. And uh, we ask each one of them to deal with a specific issue relating to women's ordination. We also had three panel discussions. 
uh, where all of the scholars got together and we discussed certain issues. And we ended with a town hall meeting, a two-hour town hall meeting, where people could send in their questions uh, for the panel to answer the questions. Uh, all of these presentations are on YouTube. Uh, you can go and watch them. Uh, they will be available after the editing is finished for purchase. We're going to make it at a very nominal cost so that they can be spread like the leaves of autumn. And uh, so uh, I made the first presentation. It was the keynote message. And it's what you contain in the last section of the syllabus. Uh, there are, I think, 40 different uh, questions that I ask and I answer regarding the issue of women's ordination. So I hope that you will uh, read this material. There's uh, lots of pages. There are probably close to 100 pages more that you have to read. But um, I think it's important so that you're informed on many other issues that we were not able to touch upon here um, in our study together. Now I am going to switch gears and I'm going to go from the beginning to the end. It's good to have at least one message that deals with end time events. And so we are going to speak about end time events. And uh, so let's just bow our heads reverently and ask the Lord to be with us as we begin our study. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to call, it, call you Father. When many earthly fathers fail us, you are our unfailing Father, Amen. our loving Father, our caring Father, and also a Father who disciplines us. We thank you for all of your qualities. We thank you for your beautiful character. We thank you, Father, that you have revealed to us exactly what is going to happen in the last days. Not so that we can satisfy our intellectual curiosity about end time events, but so that we can personally be ready and we can proclaim your message so that many, many others can be saved in your kingdom. Amen. We ask, Father, that you will bless our study together that uh, you will give us uh, understanding, that you will give us your wisdom as we open your holy book. And we thank you for the privilege of prayer and for hearing us, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the title of my presentation is Mission, Message, and Method. Mission, Meth Message, and Method. And, um, you know, I decided to give you the title because I can't, um, you know, I have to keep up with Randy Skeet. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's speak about, first of all, the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm going to read three verses from Scripture that explain our unique mission. The first text, and by the way, these are very well-known texts. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14 is the first one. Here Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So our mission is to go into all of the world. It says, to all of the nations, into all of the world. That is our mission. Of course, we're all acquainted with Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, where it amplifies this concept of Matthew 24, 14. It says there, and uh, you know, I know that you know this by memory, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Once again, our mission is to take the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Amen. Well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and then Mark 16, verse 15, says, Jesus speaking, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So these three texts tell us what the mission 
of the church is. It is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and when the mission is finished, then the end will come, as Jesus said. Now, every denomination in the world, every Christian denomination in the world, claims to be proclaiming the gospel to the world. So the question is this, what makes Seventh-day Adventists unique? Why did call, God call us into existence? The answer is that God did not call us only to preach the everlasting gospel in all of the world. He called us to preach the everlasting gospel in a special context, the context of the three angels' message of Revelation 14 and verses 6 through 12. It is a gospel that not only saves us, it is a gospel that makes demands on us. In this sense, the message that God has given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church goes beyond just saying that Jesus came to this earth to save human beings, which is what is being preached by all denominations, all Christian denominations in the world. Our message is to take the gospel, yes, but it's the gospel in the context of the three angels' message. That is our message. Now I'd like to read a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy on why God brought our church into existence. This statement is found in volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 19. 9 Testimonies, page 19. This is how it reads. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. That is a defensive, um, a defensive task, right? A watchman watches to see when the enemy is going to come, right? So God has called Seventh-day Adventists to be watchmen. We have a defensive role. But not only a defensive role, because she continues saying, and light bearers. That is our offensive role. We are to go on defense and on offense. Defend the church from the enemy, but at the same time, go out and conquer by preaching the gospel. This statement continues saying, to them, that is to Seventh-day Adventists, has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them, that is on us, is shining a wonderful light. That is an awesome privilege. Once again, on them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They, now notice, not only do we have an awesome privilege, because she continues saying, they have given, been given a work of the most solemn import. It is a privilege, but it is also a grave responsibility. And then she says what that work is. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. I like that last section. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. And that's why wherever you look, uh, when you're around secrets unsealed, you see the three angels everywhere. Because that is our mission and our message is to take the three angels' messages to the world. Now what is the content of our message then? It is Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12. So let's read this passage which we've read many times before and see what it says and then we'll summarize certain important points about the three angels' message. I'm reading beginning in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now notice, here are the demands, see? The, the first angel's message makes demands on us. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. By the way, in the Greek these are imperatives. They are commands. Fear God is in, in the imperative mode. Give glory to Him is the imperative mode as well. For the hour of His judgment has come. And now comes the third imperative. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And then in verse 8 we have a second message. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. When the Bible repeats something twice it means that it's, <laughs> you can take it to the bank. I mean Babylon is really fallen, is what it's saying. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then you'll notice in verse 9 the third angel's message. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And I now I want you to notice that the same is repeated that was mentioned at the beginning of the third angel's message. Because the beginning said uh, in verse 9, If anyone worships the beast, his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. Now the third angel's message ends in the same way by saying, And they have no rest day or night who worship what? The beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. But the third angel's message doesn't end there. Is God going to have a group of people that will not worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark? Yes. yes. And they are identified in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. The word patience is better translated perseverance. See, in the Greek there are two words that are translated patience in, into the English versions. One is the word makrothumia. Uh, that is translated in the King James Version, long-suffering. That has more to do with the type of patience that, uh, that we think of. But the word here is hupomone. It means perseverance. Here is the perseverance of the saints, because God's people are going to need perseverance in the trials that are going to come. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who what? Who keep the commandments of God and actually the word have isn't there, but keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those are the three angels' messages. Now let me summarize some important things about these three messages. First of all, we know that these messages are God's last message to the world. There will be no message after these. And by the way, when I say there will be no message, we know about Revelation 18, but Revelation 18 is an intensification of the second angel's message. In other words, you put booster cables to the second angel's message so that they are proclaimed with great power on a worldwide scale. So these messages are the last, and you say, how do we know that they are the last? It's very simple, because when the third angel's message is proclaimed, immediately afterwards, you have the Lord Jesus sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand and he is going to harvest the earth and he's going to harvest the grapes. Everyone has been divided into two groups. Ellen White explains what the harvest is. 
She says, the tares and the wheat, speaking about the parable of the tares and the wheat, Christ's Object Lessons, page 72, the tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. So the three angels' message are the last message of God to the world. There is no other message that is going to be proclaimed to the world. Second, these messages are accompanied by the power of the latter rain. You say, how do we know that? Very simple. Because when they are proclaimed, the harvest of the earth is ripened, and the grapes of the earth are ripened as well. What was it that ripened the harvest in biblical times? It was the latter rain. So if the three angels proclaim their messages, and then immediately you see that the harvest is ripe, which represents the righteous, and the grapes are ripe, which represents the wicked, it means that the three angels' messages ripened the earth for the harvest. And what ripened the earth was the latter rain. These three messages are accompanied by the power of the latter rain. One final point about these messages, in summary, these messages will polarize the world into two groups. Those who accept them will receive the seal of God, and those who reject them will receive the mark of the beast. For this reason, Ellen White expressed the life and death nature of these messages. She said in early writings, pages 258 and 259, Woe to him! who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. These messages are not optional. These messages are a matter of life and death. Can you imagine the privilege of God entrusting to us His remnant church, the last message for the world that will divide the world into two groups. God would want all of the world to join Him on His side. But we know that that's not going to happen because individuals have freedom of choice. Now what are the elements of these messages? Well, the first angel's message actually gives us the positive message of what the world is supposed to do. It says that our task is to proclaim the everlasting gospel. And then three commands are made that go with the everlasting gospel. The first command is fear God. That doesn't mean that we're afraid of God. It means that we have an intense respect for Him. You know, when Ellen White says that we have to appear before the awful throne of God, you know, we use the word awful as, uh, in a different way than what it's intended. Uh, there's a song, that, the, the hymn that is before Jehovah's awful throne. You know, if, if it's awful, would we want to be there? Well, you know, the word that is behind that is awe. Full of awe, in other words. That's what fear God means. It means that we're, we stand in awe of God. We fear Him and we respect Him. And that's the reason why when we come to church, we dress appropriately because we're coming in, into His awful presence. That's the reason why we don't hoop it up in the worship service. That's why we're careful about the music we have in the worship service. Because we're coming into the presence of the awesome God. So the first angel's message says, have an intense respect for God. Hold God in awe. Obey God. All of these ideas are contained in the first angel's message. There's a second imperative. Give glory to Him. You know, we can't glorify God, really, because we don't have any glory to give. The glory that we give God is the glory that came from Him in the first place. <laughs> See, the glory of God shone on Moses, and then the glory of God, you know, shone to the people. But ultimately, the people said, hey, the face of Moses shines. They were supposed to say, hey, that's the Lord's glory. <laughs> and the glory of God is His character. So the first angel's message tells us that we are to reveal His character to the world, His character of love. Not only His character of love, His character of justice. See, some people want to focus only on one side. Ah, God is a God of mercy. Amen, hallelujah. But God is also a God of justice. That's part of His character as well. 
He will by no means justify the guilty. He will justify people who repent, as we heard this morning, and give their sins to Jesus. But he will not justify those who choose to remain guilty in the sight of the Lord by not claiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So the second imperative calls us to glorify God. And then it tells us why we're supposed to fear God and give glory to Him. Because we are in the hour of God's judgment. There's no one in the world that is preaching that we are now in the hour of God's judgment except the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's no church in the world that says that we're to fear God and give glory to Him because we are now in the hour of the judgment. And the reason why is because the Christian world, the judgment is absurd to them. Because they believe that when a person dies, if they were good, they went to heaven. If they were bad, they went to hell. So they already received their reward at death, so why would there be a judgment? Are you following me? The idea of the judgment contains the idea of the state of the dead. And so, and so God is saying, you know, fear God and give glory to Him because we are now in the hour of the judgment. And then you have the third imperative, which is worship the Creator. And by the way, we usually connect that with the Sabbath. But you know what? It sends us back to creation, to everything that God established at creation. It includes the correct concept of marriage as the union between a man and a woman. That is part of the creation order. It includes the proper roles within marriage and in the church by extension. It includes the diet that God established originally in the Garden of Eden. And it includes God's holy Sabbath. In other words, the command to worship the Creator, because it is a command, it is an imperative, includes going back to Genesis and fulfilling God's plan as it was in the beginning. No plan B. No third option. This message calls us to go back to the original plan. Like Jesus said, you know, because of the hardness of your hearts, God gave you a plan B. But at the beginning, it was not so. Jesus always went back to the beginning as the ideal. You see, the, the, the Jews of Christ's day had disfigured marriage. Jesus says, we go back to the beginning. They disfigure the Sabbath. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. He took man back to the Sabbath as it was established originally at the beginning. And so the first angel's message calls us to keep God's holy Sabbath. It calls upon us to raise up the correct concept of marriage, roles within marriage, the issue of diet, and everything that God established originally at the very beginning. And then we have the, third angel, the second angel's message. The second angel's message says that Babylon is fallen. Why is Babylon fallen? Because she rejected the first angel's message. You see, the second message is connected with the first. Because Babylon rejected the first angel's message to fear God, to give glory to God, and to worship the Creator, Babylon fell. And instead of giving the world God's unfermented wine, which represents true doctrine, Babylon has made the nations drunk with her false doctrine. Because she did not accept the true doctrine of the first angel's message, she now gives the wine of false doctrine to the nations. And then the third angel's message, which is the most solemn of all, says, if you remain in Babylon, you will end up worshiping the beast. And you will end up worshiping his image. And you will end up receiving his mark. That is a synthesis of the three angels' message. Are these messages being proclaimed by anyone else in the world today? No one. All of the churches claim to be proclaiming the everlasting gospel. They say, we're preaching the gospel. But there are very few churches that are saying that we need to return to the creation ideal 
in all of its dimensions. That we need to be respectful to God in our worship. That we need to reveal the character of God to the world. Very few. That the dead are dead. That we are now in the hour of God's judgment. And we need to prepare because soon the judgment will pass to the living. That's us. And so the Adventist church is the world's, God's last stand in the world. This message that God has given to us. But I not only want to focus on our mission, which is to go to all the world. I don't want to focus only on our message. I want to dedicate most of our time in our study to our method. You say, what do you mean, our method? Well, let me explain that we have a special method of interpreting Bible prophecy, which helps us understand the three angels' messages. It is normally called historicism. I prefer to call it the historical flow method. There is only one church in all of the world that properly interprets Bible prophecy and has the correct method of interpreting prophecy, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm not saying, oh, we're the only ones that have the truth. We're the only ones who know. I'm saying it truthfully, but not arrogantly. But I have to tell you the truth. There is no other church today that uses the historical flow method the way the Seventh-day Adventist Church does. And you say, well, what is the historical flow method like? Basically, this method says that the great lines of Bible prophecy begin to be fulfilled in the days in which the prophet wrote. And then there is a series of events from that point on that are fulfilled in succession without interruption culminating with Jesus setting up His everlasting kingdom. That is the historical flow method. Which means that if you know what the starting point is, you can follow the trajectory of prophecy step after step after step after step until the consummation at the end. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, we're going to use one Bible prophecy as our example of the historical flow method because it is related to the three angels' message. I'm referring to Daniel chapter 7, a very well-known chapter. But it gives us an example, probably the best example in Scripture, of how the historical flow method works. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, you have four beasts. What is the first beast? The first beast is a lion. What does the lion represent? Babylon. Let me ask you, is that the very kingdom that Daniel lived in? Yes. So where does Daniel 7 begin? It begins in the time that the prophet lived and wrote. You have a beginning reference point for prophecy, for the prophecy of Daniel 7. Are you with me? You know where to start, in other words. So after the lion, you have a what? A bear. And what does the bear represent? It represents the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Let me ask you, did Medo-Persia rule after Babylon? Yes. By the way, you don't even have to go to history books. Because in Daniel chapter 5, it says that the last king was Belshazzar, and the Medes and Persians took over the kingdom. So you don't have to go outside of Daniel to know that the second kingdom are the Medes and the Persians. It's right there in the book of Daniel. Is there any parenthesis between one kingdom and the other? Is there any gap between the two kingdoms? No gap. No. And then after the second beast, the bear, then you have a leopard. And what does the leopard represent? Greece. Is there any gap between the bear and the leopard? No, there's no gap. No time lapse in between. One falls and the next rises to power. So the third beast is Greece. And then after the third beast, see, are we following the trajectory? E easy. We know where to start. 
We say we start with Babylon, then we move on to Medo-Persia. By the way, you don't even need to go outside the book of Daniel to know that the third kingdom is Greece either. <laughs> because in Daniel chapter 8, you have, uh, you have a ram that has two horns, which is identified as the Medes and Persians, and then you have a he-goat that comes and flies uh, above the earth and it attacks the ram and it destroys the ram and it's identified as Greece. So for the first three kingdoms, you don't even have to go outside of Daniel. You don't have to go to the history books. Daniel itself tells us what those three kingdoms are. And so the third beast is the kingdom of Greece. And then you have a fourth beast. What does that fourth beast represent? You know, we call it the nondescript beast because it's, there's no beast in real life that is similar to it. But really this beast, even though it, the beast is not called a dragon in Daniel 7, it is a dragon because Revelation chapter 12 identifies this beast as a dragon, as a dracon is the word in Greek. This beast is a dragon. So the first fourth beast is a dragon beast. And what does that fourth beast represent? Rome. But now I want you to notice something very important. This dragon beast has four consecutive stages of dominion. Did you? Are you with me or not? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, let me hear you in a minute. Say, I hear lots of amens for Randy, but none for me. <laughs> that, that's, that's because he says amen, and he can, can encourage you to say amen. So I'm going to encourage you to say amen as well. Okay, now let's take a look then at Daniel chapter 7 and this fourth beast. It has four consecutive stages of dominion. Go with me to Daniel 7, verses 23 and 24. Daniel 7, 23 and 24. You're going to see the stages clearly. Now in Daniel 7, there are only three. We have to go to Revelation 13 to find the fourth stage of this fourth beast. Notice what it says there in Daniel 7, 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. That's the first stage. The, the fourth beast without any, any horns on its head. The fourth beast by itself. So it says, Shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. And now notice, the ten horns are ten kings, and kings and kingdoms are interchangeable in prophecy. The ten horns are ten kings, notice carefully now, who shall arise from this kingdom. Does the kingdom have to exist in order for the horns to arise from it? Yes. yes. So what is the second stage of this dragon beast? After it rules for a while, it sprouts ten horns. That's the second stage. And we know what happened with the Roman Empire. It was divided into ten kingdoms. But Rome did not have the ten kingdoms when it rose to power. They come out later, just like the prophecy says. But that's only the second stage. Notice the third stage. It says in verse 24 again, the ten horns are ten kings or kingdoms who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. So do you see the sequence? First the dragon beast by itself. Then the dragon beast sprouts ten horns and then after the ten horns are there, up in the middle of them comes a little horn three successive stages. Any gap in between? No gaps. No parentheses. And we have several interesting details about this little horn. It speaks blasphemies against the Most High. And we know what blasphemy represents. It represents when an individual claims to be God's representative on earth in the absolute sense and when that power claims to be able to forgive sins. It also says that the little horn would be a persecuting power. 
it shall persecute the saints of the Most High. We're told in Daniel chapter 7. We're also told that the little horn thought that he could change times and God's law. And we're actually told how long the little horn would, would exercise its dominion. It says that he would exercise dominion for time, times, and the dividing of time. Which is how long? 1,260 days, but days are equivalent to years. Now what date did this little horn cease to exercise dominion? We all know and uh, this, and I'm not going to go into it because that's not the, the point that I want us to see. I want us to see the sequence here. Its period of dominion lasted from 538 and ended in 1798. In other words, its period of rule was limited. Are you clear in the three stages? Rome by itself, Rome divided, and Rome under the rulership of the Roman Catholic papacy, which lasts till 1798. And what happened in 1798? It must have lost its power. Because if it didn't lose its power, then it, the Bible would say that it ruled longer. And it didn't rule shorter either, because if it ruled shorter, God would have said that it was going to be less than three and a half times. Are you with me or not? It ruled exactly three and a half times. 1260 years. 1798, February 12, 1798. The Pope was taken prisoner where he died in France. And the papacy lost the support of the civil power. That's the key point in 1798. The deadly wound, listen carefully what I'm going to say, the deadly wound that was given to the papacy does not mean that the Roman Catholic Church was going to cease to exist because the Roman Catholic Church continued functioning as a church. The deadly wound simply means that the sword of the state that the papacy used to persecute would be taken out of her hand and the state would turn against her. That's the significant event in 1798 the sword of the state was removed from the papacy so that the papacy could no longer use the power of the state or the civil power to persecute like it had done during the 1260 years. So in 1798, it lost the power of the sword. And that was the end, right? How many stages did I mention that this uh, fourth beast was going to have? Four. Four. Now you say, where is the fourth? It's not explicitly in Daniel 7. It is, it is hinted at in Daniel 7 because Daniel 7 says that this power that ruled 1260 years will be destroyed at the coming of Jesus. So you have the hint that this power must be ruling when Jesus comes in order for it to be destroyed at that time. But it doesn't come forth clearly in Daniel 7. But that's why I'm thankful to God that He gave us revelation. You see, in Revelation 13, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to read the verses because you're well acquainted with the verses. In Revelation 13, we have a repetition of Daniel chapter 7. Same sequence. If you read verse 2, it speaks of a lion, a bear, a leopard, a ten-horned dragon. Same beasts of Daniel 7, only in Revelation 13, they are in reverse order. You see, in Daniel 7, it's lion, bear, leopard, dragon with ten horns. Whereas in Revelation chapter 13, it goes backwards. It goes dragon, leopard, bear, lion. Because Daniel is looking forwards and John is looking backwards. And so you have this, this sequence. Revelation 13 mentions it. Lion, bear, leopard, dragon with ten horns, same dragon in Revelation 12 that has ten horns, and then this dragon with ten horns gives its throne, its authority, and its power to the beast. The beast is the same as the little horn in the sequence. You say, how do we know that? Because we have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn. In Revelation 13 you have lion, bear, 
leopard, dragon, ten horns, beast. The sequence is the same. But not only is it the same sequence, but you also see by the actions of the beast that the beast is the same as the little horn. Does the beast persecute the saints of the Most High? Yes. Does the beast speak blasphemies against the Most High? Does it have a mark of its power that it's going to impose? That's the change in the law. Does the beast rule for 42 months? The same time period, expressed a little differently, but the same time period as the little horn. Absolutely. So we have Revelation 13, 1 through 10, very parallel to Daniel chapter 7. Lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn or beast, and the beast rules how long? 42 months, or time times of the dividing of time, receives a deadly wound. And for a time, this beast is out of action. But then you have the fourth stage of the fourth beast. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Uh, you have a fourth stage to this dragon beast, and that is the little horn or the beast, its deadly wound is going to be healed. And the dragon will rule again through the little horn. It says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, I saw one of his heads, that is of the beast, as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all Europe, see this is globalized now. In the past it was in Europe, primarily. But now it says, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Is there going to be a fourth stage to this dragon beast? Absolutely. Is it going to be Roman? Are all these stages Roman? The dragon beast is Rome. The ten horns are on the head of the dragon beast, so they must be Roman. The little horn comes out of the head of the dragon beast, which is Rome, so it must be Roman. And it's going to rule again, which means that it must be Rome, the same Rome that persecuted during the 1260 years, is going to persecute again. So far so good? Now the question is, how is its wound going to be healed? You say, okay, you have this scenario of prophecy, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire divided the papal Rome to 1798, and we know that the deadly wound is going to be healed, but uh, can we know beyond the deadly wound how the wound is going to be healed? Absolutely. Because when the beast was receiving its deadly wound, another beast was rising. Are you seeing what historicism is all about? It is a disciplined way of studying prophecy. You don't have to guess who the Antichrist is. You just follow the trajectory of history. Is there another beast that rises when the first beast receives its deadly wound and falls? Absolutely. This beast is mentioned in Revelation 13, 11, immediately after the first beast receives its deadly wound. It says, he who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the perseverance of the saints. Then I saw another beast. Then. When the first beast falls, then you have another beast that rises. And this beast rises from where? From the earth. All of the other beasts arose from the sea, and the sea means heavily populated areas. I don't know if you've ever noticed that prophecy moves from east to west. The first two kingdoms are in Asia. The next two kingdoms are in Europe. So this next kingdom most likely would be west of Europe, and we're not talking about the Atlantic Ocean. What nation is west of Europe? The United States of America. <clears throat> would this beast rise in a different place? If it was going to rise in Asia or Europe, it would say that it came forth from the, from the sea, like the previous ones. But it's rising in a different place. 
And we're told there that this beast that rises from the earth, it has two horns like a lamb. But it speaks like a dragon. <coughs> now, I've written in my book, uh, Prophecies of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, several things, interesting things about this beast, which usually we don't take into account as Adventists. These two horns represent two kingdoms. Traditionally, we said that they represent two principles. And I believe that Ellen White is right when she says they are two principles. But behind the idea of two principles, you have two kingdoms. Because horns in Scripture represent kingdoms. You can't say that the ten horns on the head of the dragon are kingdoms and then say that the two horns on this beast are merely principles. People say, well, what is your principle of interpretation? Well, because. No. You see... Fundamental to the idea of the principles of religious and civil liberty is the idea that there are two kingdoms that are to be separate from one another. The church and the state. Each with its own sword. The church with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the state with the sword to punish violations of the civil code. That's Romans chapter 13. Not together, but separate. You know, you have the closest example to this is found in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, you have a ram, one beast, one nation. But this beast has two horns on its head. And these two horns represent two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians, two kingdoms in one nation. And so these two horns represent two kingdoms in one nation. You say, well, the United States is in two kingdoms. Yes, it is. Because in this nation, you are a citizen of the church and you are a citizen of the state. And traditionally, they have been separate. They're two horns like a lamb. So they must be the two kingdoms that the lamb recognized. Jesus said, render therefore to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Those are the two kingdoms that Jesus spoke. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He recognized two kingdoms. His, which is the church, upon this, upon this rock I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom, he said to, to Peter, which text which is misinterpreted. And you have also the kingdom of the state. So do you, did you realize that you're citizens of two countries? <laughs> In one nation. We're in one nation, but you're a citizen of the church. If you were baptized, you became a member, and you're a citizen also of the United States of America if you are not from Canada or from Great Britain or from another country. So these two horns like a lamb represent the principles upon which this nation was built. Separation of church and state. Full civil, that's the state, and religious, that's the church, liberty. But we are told that this beast will speak like a dragon. The horns will not be broken. It will still have the two horns. But it will speak like a dragon. Now let's notice some interesting things about this beast. Every previous beast conquers the beast before it by warfare. The bear attacked the lion and gained power. The leopard attacked the bear to gain power. The dragon beast annihilated the leopard to gain its power. But what's interesting about this beast that rises from the earth, instead of fighting against the previous power, it helps the previous power recover its throne. You say, how do you know that? Revelation 13. There are several expressions that, that as Adventists we haven't looked at carefully. Everything this beast from the earth does, it does to please the first beast. It does not fight against the previous beast. It helps, us, helps it recover its power. For example, in Revelation 13, we are told that it exercises all of the authority of the first beast. Everything that it does, it does in the presence of the first beast. 
It commands all to worship the first beast. It, it makes an image of the first beast and commands everyone to worship the beast, the, the image of the first beast. It imposes the mark of the first beast. In other words, this power does everything to help the previous beast regain its power. Furthermore, you know what? When Revelation describes the dragon, what does the dragon represent? Yes, I'll give you half credit for that. The dragon is identified as Satan in Revelation chapter 12, but there's more to the story. It's Satan working through Rome. The dragon stood next to the woman to devour her child when the child was born. Who's the child? Jesus. Who stood next to the child to try and kill him? The devil? No. The devil through? Herod. Then the woman flees to the wilderness for 1260 years and the dragon goes after her. Which power was the power that went after the church? Rome. Papal Rome. Now listen carefully. This must mean that if this beast from the earth speaks like a dragon, it speaks like Rome. In other words, it is going to help Rome recover its lost supremacy. Are you following me or not? So, what do we have? We have Babylon. We know where to begin this process. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the divided Roman Empire. Then the little horn rules for 1260 years. Then the, the wound is healed by this beast that rises from the earth, which represents which nation? It represents the United States of America. You see, our method is the only way in which we can understand the third angel's message. Because the third angel's message says, don't worship the beast. How can you obey that if you don't know who the beast is? Are you following me? Yes. It says, don't worship the image of the beast. How can you know what the image of the beast is if you don't know what the beast is? It says, don't receive the mark of the beast. How can you know what the mark of the beast is unless you know what the beast is? Does this method help us understand the third angel's message? It does. And if you don't understand who the beast is, you will end up worshiping him. Now, let me just share with you some things that are happening. Two mainline Protestant denominations, the Lutherans and the Methodists, have signed a document with Roman Catholics. This was several years ago, 1999 basically stating that Luther's protest is over. And there is a strong push among charismatic Protestants in North America to unite with the papacy. What is remarkable is that Protestants are taking the initiative. That's exactly what this prophecy says. This beast will help the other beast. Now let me go back a little bit to the Protestant Reformation. We need, to, we need this as a framework because the devil has duped the world by having the churches interpret prophecy with, a, with the wrong method. See, if you have the wrong method, you'll totally miss the three angels' message. Protestantism began in 1517. That's a traditional date when Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the cathedral door in Wittenberg. Soon, Protestantism spread like grass fire, and the Roman Catholic papacy not only lost thousands of individuals, it lost entire nations to Protestantism. They were very concerned. And so they called the Church Council, the Council of Trent, the longest council in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. It lasted from 1545 to 1563. And the, the express purpose for this council was to counteract the theology of the Protestant movement. And so what they did, they attacked Protestant theology 
and exalted Roman Catholic theology, but they kept on losing followers and nations. So they said, what is it that is causing people to leave? And they soon discovered that it wasn't so much the theology of the reformers, but rather the eschatology of the reformers, the method of interpreting prophecy. They soon found out that the, the reformers were saying, hey, we can follow the tra trajectory of prophecy to know exactly when the Antichrist was, was going to appear. They knew that, that there's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the Ten Kingdoms, and they said, we're living in, in, in the time after that, so the church must be the Antichrist, the apostate church. They could see it because of the sequence of Bible prophecy. So they said, we have to do more than, than counteract the theology of the Protestant reformers. We have to counteract the method of interpreting Bible prophecy. And so two Jesuit scholars, if you want to read a full accounting of this, get the book Futurism's Incredible Journeys. It has all of the documentation about how Protestantism shifted its way of interpreting prophecy and adopted the Roman Catholic way of interpreting prophecy. One of those scholars was a fellow by the name of Luis de Alcázar, Jesuit from Spain. And he established a system of interpreting prophecy which is known as preterism. It's the idea that the little horn, the little horn uh, was, it can't be us, the papacy, he said, because he was living in the period of the papacy. He said, no, the little horn represents a nasty individual called Antiochus Epiphanes who lived in 165 B.C. He desecrated the Jewish temple. He persecuted the Jews. You know, he tried to change their calendar. That's the times. So that was, that, the little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes. And it says, as far as the beast of Revelation 13, the beast of Revelation 13 represents Nero. Because there was this tradition in the Roman Empire that Nero was going to be killed and then he was going to resurrect. His wound was going to be healed. So Nero is the beast of Revelation 13. Now what would happen if you said that the little horn and the beast were uh, Nero and Antiochus Epiphanes? The idea is it has nothing to do with us. Are you with me? And then another Roman Catholic scholar arose, also a Jesuit from Spain, Francisco Rivera, and he said, you know, I kind of disagree with, uh, with Alcázar, Luis de Alcázar. He says, no, no, no. The little horn and the beast represents a power that is going to arise immediately before the second coming of Jesus. And he's going to rebuild the Jewish temple. And he's going to sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple. And he's going to sit there for three and a half literal years. And he's going to be an atheist that will blaspheme the Lord, of, the Lord Most High. And so he projected the beast and the little horn to the distant future. What is the result? This prophecy has nothing to do with us. And you know, Protestants embrace these two methods. The mainline churches in the world, the Protestant mainline churches, and I mean by those like the United Methodists, the United Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, the United Lutherans, they are preterists in their interpretation of prophecy. You read any commentary from liberal scholars, they'll tell you that, that, the, that the little horn was Antiochus Epiphanes. Protestant commentaries. And they'll tell you that the beast of Revelation 13 was Nero directly imported from Roman Catholicism. On the other hand, conservative Protestants like Pentecostals and Charismatics and, and Evangelicals, they have embraced futurism. You can turn on your television set any Sunday morning and watch these evangelists present their scenario. They'll talk about the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, won't they? And they'll talk about, you know, this Antichrist, this nasty individual who's going to favor the Jews for three and a half years, but then the last three and a half years he's going to blaspheme the Most High. He's going to build this great big statue of himself, this big image, and he's going to command everyone to worship the image of himself, and he's going to put a big tattoo on people's foreheads or on their right hand. And so what has the devil done? What the devil has done, he has duped liberal Protestants and conservative Protestants into thinking that these prophecies will fulfill in the distant past or will be fulfilled in the future 
after the rapture of the church and as a result they cannot see right in front of their faces that in Rome the Antichrist is growing and in the United States apostate Protestantism is wanting to ally itself with Rome. They can't see it because they're looking in the wrong place. So what is the last hope for the world to understand Bible prophecy? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. And sad to say, this message is muted in many Seventh-day Adventist pulpits. It's a package deal. You know, those who sustain contemplative prayer, they're usually also into contemporary Christian music. They're also into not quoting the spirit of prophecy. They're also not wanting to talk anything about Bible prophecy. It's a package deal. A desire to hide our identity, and let's not offend anyone. And as a result, we're, gonna off we're not going to offend a bunch of people in the hell. Now let me give you some examples of this. Probably most of you have heard of Tony Palmer, who was killed recently in a motorcycle accident. Do you know what motivated Tony Palmer? You know, he was, he was a, an Anglican clergyman of the Celtic tradition. The Anglican church has been splintered into a bunch of offshoots. Did you know that there are 33,000 denominations, in, Protestant denominations in, in North America and the United States? And so Tony Palmer looked at the Christian church. He said, this can't go on. The church is so, so fragmented. He was talking primarily about his own church. So he was invited to speak at a Charismatic Leaders Convention on February 25, 2014 by Kenneth Copeland, a renowned television evangelist. Scary. By the way, by the way a Freemason. And Tony Palmer was invited to speak. He stood up and he said that he had come in the spirit of Elijah to bring the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons. He's bringing the Elijah message. <laughs> he said that God had called him to unite all Christians. He lamented that after Luther, Protestantism had been fragmented into 33,000 denominations. This led him to say, diversity is divine and division is diabolic. He stated that God gives charismatics the glory that they may be one. He says the glory is to be one. And then he had to say this about doctrine. He says it is the glory that glues us together, not the doctrine. It's the glory. If you accept that, that the glory of God is living in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrine later upstairs. Let me tell you that if you don't understand the doctrine, you're not going to make it upstairs. Then he said, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility. Because Jesus said that until we are one, the world will not believe. The question is, one how? As I mentioned, in 1999, the Lutherans and the Catholics signed a joint declaration on righteousness by faith. If Luther resurrected today, he would die of a heart attack. <laughs> Lutherans and Catholics agreeing on righteousness by faith? That's what led to the Protestant Reformation. Five years later, the Methodists signed the same document. And, of course, Tony Palmer lamented that other evangelical denominations had not signed this document. And then he said, brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours? He went on to say, the protest has been over for 15 years, since 1999. If there is no longer any protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe now we are all Catholics again. But the story doesn't end there. Palmer was a very close friend of the present Pope before he was Pope in Argentina, Bergoglio. And uh, 
Palmer had visited the Pope and asked him to uh, record a message on his iPhone to take to this convention. And so uh, the Pope's message to this convention was presented by Tony Palmer there. And I'm going to share with you some of the things the Pope said to this group of charismatics, thousands of them. These were leaders of churches. These weren't just common church members. These were leaders of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of charismatics in the United States. The Pope said, I am yearning that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. I am yearning for that embrace. At the end of his message, he said to those at the convention in this iPhone message, please pray for me. I need your prayers. And I will pray for you, but I need your prayers. And let's pray to the Lord that he unites us all. Come on, we are brothers. Let's give each other a spiritual hug and let God complete the work that he has begun. And this is a miracle. The miracle of unity has begun. I ask you to bless me, I bless you. From brother to brother, I embrace you. After playing the message, Kenneth Copeland walked up to the stage. If you don't understand, Kenneth Copeland is a man who has great clout in the United States of America among charismatics. He walked up to the stage repeating several times, glory, 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 and the people stood and clapped and raised their hands. And then Copeland said, we do not know how to pray for him as we ought, uh, to pray for the Pope as we ought. So then he started praying in tongues. Then he told Tony Palmer, bring your cell phone, I want to record a message to send back to the Pope. And this is what Kenneth Copeland said to the Pope. These leaders represent literally tens of thousands that love you, that believe that God is with you. And in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. We do bless you we receive your blessing. It is very, very important to us. And we bless you. Now notice the text that he's using. This is something that God tells that we're supposed to do for God. And we bless you with all our hearts. We bless you with all our souls. We bless you with all our might. And we thank you, sir. We thank God for you. And so all of us declare together, be blessed. Later on in the television program, Tony Palmer said that anyone who is, in, is not in favor of unity is a spiritual racist. But it doesn't end with uh, Tony Palmer. Ever heard of James Robeson? Another television evangelist who has a great following in the United States? Took a trip to Rome to visit the Pope. And this, by the way, he gave the... Uh, the Pope a high five, the first high five that the Pope ever gave in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. This is what he said to the Pope, Pope Francis, let me just say to you that I see Jesus in you. And in Christ we are brothers, we are family. Thank you for speaking the language of love, that all may come to know him and love him and love one another. On May 5 of this year, James Robinson's program, Life Today, Tony Palmer, who was the invited guest, said this, Diversity is divine, it is division that is diabolic. Jesus' theology is that if God is in you, and you are in God, and God is in me, and I am in God, we are one together in God. <laughs> he continues saying, Our sin is that we don't make our unity visible because we allow our diversities to divide us. And if we elevate anything to divide us, we are elevating it above the cross. So, whether it is a doctrine or dogma, or an expression, if you use that to divide our unity, you have elevated that doctrine, or whatever it may be, above the cross. Now we are not saying put doctrine aside, certainly not. 
Oh, so that sounds good. But notice the only doctrine that he accepts. He says, no, no, we are not saying put doctrine aside. Certainly not. Pope Francis recognizes only two fundamental doctrines. Love for God and love for your neighbor. End of doctrine. Ever heard of Joel Osteen? He also took a trip to Rome. I could mention many other evangelical leaders, but our time is up. On a television program after visiting the Pope, Joel Osteen said, I just felt very honored and very humbled. <coughs> said it was amazing. And even to go back into that part of the Vatican, because it was taken into parts where people don't usually go, he says there's so much history there. You better believe there is. <laughs> there's so much history there. The place that they took us through, you feel that deep respect and reverence for God. Osteen attended Mass at St. Peter's Square on Wednesday prior to the meeting with the Pope with 100,000 people present there. And uh, I'm going to read now the, road, the words of Osteen. He said, afterwards the Pope spent an hour and a half going through the crowd with the Pope, Pope Mobile greeting people. It was very heartwarming to see him caring for people. I love the fact that he's made the church more inclusive not trying to make it smaller, but try to make it larger to take everybody in. So that just resonates with me. Let me ask you something. Do you think that these Protestant ministers would be traveling to the Vatican if they understood Bible prophecy? No. They would not touch it with a 10-foot pole, with a 1,000-foot pole. It's because they have changed the method that they are taking the initiative, like the prophecy of Revelation 13 says, to make overtures to Rome, to help Rome recover its power. We're seeing it being fulfilled before our very eyes. Have you ever heard of Ulf Ekman? I didn't think you would have. He was the founder of the largest charismatic church in the Scandinavian countries. In Christianity Today, today, March 10, 2014, uh, you had this title, Sweden's Pentecostal Mega Pastor Converts to Catholicism. The subtitle read like this, He stuns his Word of Life megachurch in Sunday sermon. He's crossing the Tiber. That's the river there in, in Rome. And then the article said, just who is Ulf Ekman? He founded the 3,300 member megachurch in one of Sweden's largest cities. He operated the largest Bible school in Scandinavia. It has educated more than 9,500 students in its period of existence. On Sunday, March 9, he announced to his stunned congregation that he was leaving his congregation to join the Roman Catholic Church. What reason did he give? This is what's most significant. He said, I have come to realize that the movement that I, for the last 30 years, have represented, despite some successes and much good that has occurred on various mission fields, is part of the ongoing Protestant fragmentation of Christendom. He said that he was going to now dedicate himself to pursue unity among all Christians. He stated that he became acquainted with Roman Catholics. He grew closer and closer to them. He said by his contacts with them, now I quote, it really challenged our Protestant prejudices. <laughs> and we realized that we, in many cases, did not have any basis for our criticism of them. We needed to know the Catholic faith better. This led us to realize that it was actually Jesus Christ who led us to unite with the Catholic Church. He also said, we have seen a great love for Jesus and a sound theology founded on the Bible and classic dogma. That is a code expression for tradition. We have seen a great love for Jesus and a sound theology founded on the Bible and classic dogma. We have experienced, notice it's all about experience. We have experienced the richness of sacramental life, that is, partaking of the body and blood of Jesus in the Mass. 
which is not really the body and blood of Jesus. We have seen the logic in having a solid structure for priesthood that keeps the faith of the church and passes it on from one generation to the next. Apostolic succession. We have met an ethical and moral strength and consistency that dares to face up to the general opinion and a kindness toward the poor and the weak. And last but not least, we have come in contact with representatives for millions of charismatic Catholics and we have seen their living faith. What do you think? Can we proclaim the third angel's message without our method? It's impossible. Most of the world will worship the beast because they don't know who the beast is. Do you know most evangelical Christians what they're thinking? They say, we don't have to worry about that stuff because we're going to be raptured and all this stuff is, takes place after we're gone. And they're going to be caught in the world in the worst time of trouble in the history of the world. And they will not be ready because they weren't expecting to be here. So whom does it behoove to tell them? Us. Let me read you just in closing a couple of statements from Ellen White. Great Controversy 4, and then I'll give you an illustration and we'll bring this to a close because time is up. Great Controversy 445. When the leading churches of the United States united upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state. See, there's the image of the beast because it's an image of what the papacy did. The papacy used the state to persecute. The image is the, the United States will use the state to persecute. The Protestants. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties, that's because it's using the, the sword of the state, upon dissenters will inevitably result. On page 444 she says, the wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as a decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. But there has been for years, even in the days of Ellen White, in the churches of the Protestant faith, a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. She's writing 120 years ago. And then she says, to secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which are all are not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. Has the papacy changed? No. Let me end by telling you a story. There's one book that as Adventists we should, we should distribute like the leaves of autumn. The Great Controversy. Ellen White said that, that she loved that book more than silver or gold. It is the greatest prophetic commentary in the world. Hands down. If people want, what it is, is it, it's a decoded Daniel Revelation. Because Daniel Revelation gives you symbols, Ellen White interprets the symbols. So if you want to, matter of fact, understand what the symbols of Daniel Revelation mean, all you do is go to the Great Controversy and you have it explained in matter-of-fact language. That book needs to go out like the leaves of autumn. We need to give it out. Because that gives the true prophetic scenario of the end times. Many people are critical in the Adventist Church. They say, oh, no, not Great Controversy. You know, not Ellen White. We go by the Bible. When they say we go by the Bible, they're not going by the Bible if they reject the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is in harmony with the Bible. Let me give you an illustration. Last year, my wife and I were invited to go to preach in West New York, New Jersey. Yeah, in New Jersey there is a town called West New York. <laughs> it's right on the other side of the, of the um, Hudson River. So it's the, I guess it's West New York because you can see New York from that place. <laughs> But anyway, well, my wife and I went together, and uh, the lady who invited us uh, said, uh, would you be willing to come to our house to eat before one of the meetings? I said, sure. I had known her years ago when I worked in New Jersey, 
So I went to their house and we noticed that there was another young man that had come to the meetings that uh, was invited also. So I started talking to him and asking him questions and he started sharing his testimony. Very striking testimony. He said, you know, I was standing on, on a street here in West New York on a Sabbath morning and I saw this lady very nicely dressed with a Bible in her hand and she was walking down the street at about 8.30 in the morning. And he says, it struck me as strange. It looked like she was going to church. And so he went up to the lady and he said, ma'am, where are you going? She says, I'm going to church. He said, you're going to church? Today's Sabbath, not Sunday. She says, oh, yeah, but my church keeps the Sabbath as the day of rest the way the Bible says. He says, really, there's a church in the world that keeps the Sabbath? She says, oh, yeah. He says, can I go with you? She said, sure. So they walked together. When they got to the entrance of the church, there was an elder waiting there greeting people, and this young man said, said to him, uh, Sir, is this the church that keeps the Sabbath? And the elder said, Yes, it is. He said, Well, then this is my church. And he went in, sat down, enjoyed the worship service. During the sermon, the pastor mentioned the servant of the Lord, Ellen White. And it struck him. He says, Ellen White, hmm, servant of the Lord. What could that be? I think when I get home, I'll go to the internet. <laughs> you know what happens when you go to the internet. 90% of the sites are just bashing Ellen White. And by the way, all of their objections have been abundantly answered by the White estate. There's nothing, there's nothing they say that isn't old news. Nothing that can't be answered. But anyway, he went to, to uh, the internet and he started checking website after website that lambasted Ellen White. Called her a false prophet. She was wrong on this. She was wrong on that. And he said, I started thinking to myself, is this the church that I want to belong to? He started having reservations. But then he said, I started thinking, you know, I don't know of any prophet in the Bible that the people liked. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go back to church and I'm going to find out more about Ellen White from the source. So the next Sabbath he went to church and he said, you know, I, I want to know about this Ellen White. And so uh, the elder says, listen, I'm go what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a book, the book, The Great Controversy. You read the book and then you tell me if she was inspired or not. He said, okay. He took it home, and in one week he read the whole book. The next Sabbath he came to church excited. And he said to the elder who had given him the book, Sir, there is no doubt whatsoever that whoever wrote this book was inspired by God. And he became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and when we were there, he was a brand new member, he was working with his family and his friends sharing the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know what? If Adventists will not cry out, non-Adventists will. Because people are searching for the truth. And we have the, the truth that can give them assurance. They can know exactly what's happening. They can get a full night's good sleep. Not worrying about the natural disasters in the world. Not worrying about, you know, what's happening in the Middle East. Not worrying about some nasty individual appearing as the Antichrist. No, 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 no. They can be certain about where we are Amen. and where we're going. But it behooves us to share the message. Do you accept the challenge of sharing? You want to raise your hand? You want to stand? If you accept the challenge as we go out and we leave today, praise the Lord. Let's distribute the great controversy like the leaves of autumn. Let's invest resources in, in proliferating this book. There are so many, you know, David Ashery came into the church through great controversy. So did one of our greatest theologians, Hans La Rondel. Became an Adventist through great controversy. There's many of our, of our notable individuals in the Adventist church that have become members of the church through reading great controversy. So it has power. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for 
this mountaintop experience that we've had the last few days. Surely has been a blessing. Father, as we bring this summit to a close, we're sad because we've had such a great time. But at the same time, we know that we have a challenge. Now we must go from the mountaintop to the valley where the rubber meets the road. And we must share what we have learned. We must share your message with those who are searching, those who are sincere and hungering to know where everything is leading. Use us, Lord, as a powerful instrument in your hands to share this message. Bless each soul gathered here. I ask that you will give us all traveling mercies. Even those who have left, we ask that you will be with them. Keep us faithful, Lord, though the heavens fall. Faithful until the close of probation and the coming of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for having heard our prayer, because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.